Y'all, the greatest television series of all times ended. What are we going to do? I don't Dude, know. Dude, I was actually really sad when the episode I ended. can't believe <laughs> the One Piece was Saul Goodman's notebook. It was Saul days. Goodman's small stash of diamonds that were plot relevant, but got dumped in the dumpster. Uh, yeah, the this... Like, right off the bat, can a television franchise create two amazing shows in a movie that is very underrated, according to me? I think El Camino is kind of overhated. It's pretty damn good. Yeah. That's the thing. Everything this team has made has been so good. I know, like... (laughs) Which, like, uh, I, I said it as soon as it finished. It's like, well, whatever y'all work on next, I'll be there. You got me for life. Like, oh. Yeah, I know. They, they're so good at making characters and telling a story through visuals. And wrapping up a story, y'all, how did we feel about the latter part of Better Call Saul Season 6? Dude, like, Season 6 was definitely my favorite season. And it felt like the episodes mm-hmm. just got better and better as we went up to the end. We were, uh, I, th- I feel like we were all kind of scared. I don't uh, know about Joe. Yeah. But nervous uh, going into the final episode, like, what if it's not as good as it could be? Oh, yeah, like, it would have been a scenario where it's like, I don't think you can botch it like Game of Thrones. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, maybe, actually, for some people, it might have. We'll talk about it, but there yeah. is there's a, there's a group of people who don't vibe with the... With, especially a certain decision in the finale some people do not vibe with and we'll we'll discuss how we feel about that in a second but um yeah like i i personally love the season um like ever since season three i think better call saul's been a banger and it's weird because i was like okay uh, around season four or five i'm like yeah i think i like better call saul more than breaking back because all the characters and like the deep writing and how it's filmed but you know what's crazy Better Call Saul ended great, but now it's, like, muddier to say that it's better than Breaking Bad because now it's really hard not to see it as one big 11-season story. I don't know. That's yeah. the thing. I, they, they, they felt much more distinct up mm-hmm. until these last few episodes yeah. because, like some people who weren't watching the show on Twitter said, they just assumed this whole time <laughs> everything, no. everything in the show was... Pre Breaking Bad, and they're like, it's so like, funny. What, we're in post Breaking Bad timeline, and like we've been jumping around for a lot of the show. <laughs> I've seen several posts of like, wait, are we? I thought the Gene s- scenes were before Breaking Bad. There was a dude who was like, hey, he was, he, he seemed so kind too. He was like, can you answer something real quick? Um, is Gene like Saul before his great career as a lawyer? <laughs> Like, like did they, that did is they so Gene, innocent. Did they think Gene was before even Better Call Saul? The first episode opens with Gene watching Better Call Saul commercials. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, what did you think that was? Oh, that's <laughs> so good. It's, it's you know uh, what? one thing you were talking about is like, like kind of your feelings around season three or four, where like it just like it was good before then, but it really turned into something else. And you know what? I think, like, up until, like, around season three or season four, for me, this was entertaining because it was the Breaking Bad prequel, and I love a lot of these characters, and I like to see what they got up to. It was, like, cute and interesting uh, at first. And, you know, that's not to discredit the first few seasons because, like, they created a genuinely great story in those seasons and introduced these new characters that you Mm -hmm. never saw in Breaking Bad, but... I don't know. Up until then, I still viewed this as like the Breaking Bad prequel. And then around the beginning of season four, I was just like, no, I want to see what Better Call Saul has for me. Yeah. Like, I'm, I don't even care about this being a prequel anymore. And and Joe had an interesting journey, too. Uh, if you want to talk about yeah. that a little bit. Yeah. Like, I uh, started watching Better Call Saul before I even watched like anything past the first like two episodes of Breaking Bad. Uh so like it, it's just really interesting because my foundation for that entire like, uh, like world and like series is best based on like Better Call Saul. So to me, Breaking Bad is a spinoff of that show. <laughs> That's so uh, crazy. But and, I, and, I and am. I would so... say, I, Go ahead. And I would say that up until the last like four or five episodes, I think that's pretty reasonable to say like yeah which i think no. is a good thing for it to, that television show i i'm super glad yes actually because you don't want it to just be aping off of breaking bad like it does a couple of things like hey there's gail Bedeker. like 
you won't really have context for what that means without Breaking Bad, but there's very few scenes like that in Better Call Saul. But by the time you get to the last couple of episodes, it's like, oh no, this is one big universe, and you're oh, yeah. really not going to get the most out of it if, if you're not up to speed with everything. Um, so I'm really glad that Joe was able to push past like the sheer anxiety that Breaking Bad gives him to, to have all the context he needed. Once I got past, like, I think there's there's the scene in Breaking Bad where, like, they're melting the body. That was, like, the really the part when I was watching the show the first time. Where That's I was, like, tough. This is, it's tough. Especially when I was watching it, like, just out of high school. Like, yeah. The the scene just, where like, the body falls through the ceiling uh, always yes. traumatized me as a, as a young adult. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's God. Just, it's just... It's just a such, it's a weird concept because like there was a body and now there isn't like it's and like they yeah just Joe like, people die when they're killed yeah but so, like it, it's a little bit I have no problem watching that scene the scene I can't rewatch is Walt watching Jane in the bed uh, uh, for that's me, also a good for me uh, all of those are good picks Skylar singing happy birthday to Ted is a different type Ooh. of cringe <laughs> that is a good pick. that is that is a good scene um, but for all the wrong reasons it is just so uncomfortable man Damn. these characters are so fucking fun like uh, we're mm-hmm. bu- we're gonna try to do like a quickie tier list after this after we talk about the finale of better call Saul and I'm just thinking like I can't think of a franchise that has such a high concentration of S tier characters for me. Just off off the top of my head, or at least A, right? Like every character is just so well realized and like they may not have all the screen time, but everyone feels fleshed out. They are a human being with their own shit going on, with their own personality and emotions. Even like and small side characters have so much life to them in the show. That's the thing. This is I'm not gonna say it's like no, I am going to say it. This is the only series besides One Piece where I have the opinion that, like, even, like, side characters who might not even be named who show up in only one episode, I'm like, they feel like they have their own distinct personality, and I remember them. Like, for example, um, it happens a lot to people that Jimmy and Kim scheme. Uh, yeah. There, There's that lady in, like season four where kim shows up with a story where like her brother shows up with her baby and a bag of milk so that the bag of milk can spill on a map so kim can switch it out and not go through like a legal process of switching what's on the map like it's this whole thing but that lady who's like upset that kim's child is being handled by jimmy she had personality or the lady who's taking the seven million dollars in bail from jimmy when he came back from the desert she like she has some personality in like one line of dialogue it's incredible how they can pull that off oh, yeah. they find the greatest like small uh actors to do these things but okay so the finale uh what did y'all think about jimmy and kim's final fates and what were your emotions going through that finale i'm glad i watched it with joe for context and if he wasn't there i would have been a nervous wreck i probably already was but like Dude. i had i had bad vibes going into there because waterworks the second to last episode got me really stressed out <laughs> I'm really glad yeah. we all got to watch it as it came out, so we didn't have to worry about the spoilers that were honestly everywhere. Yeah, they're yeah. already everywhere. I, uh, I I sat there and just cracked jokes for Willard's sake, just just to pander to, to ease the tension that was going on in the room. He was the soul uh, of my Breaking Bad. It's true. <laughs> I can't. I can't. Know <laughs> they know my voice. I can't. You call them um, anonymously. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Side joke. Uh, uh, I I really like the ending. Uh, like I we I had talked to Willer about this a lot, like a lot. Uh, and like I was like for, for like when you end a show, it has like a show like Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul. Like the audience should already kind of know what the outcome, what your character yes, is going to be. Absolutely. And and like for for Breaking Bad with. Uh, Walt Walter is that he's going to die either by lung cancer or through his tomfoolery with like the drug cartels and whatnot. Like this man has been destined for death since the beginning of the show, so he needs he like he's going to die. I think it's right? so cute to call Walt's uh, antics tomfoolery. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's and really the good. Same with, like, <laughs> the same with like Jimmy and um, with with Better Call Saul is just like he's a lawyer. 
but he does a lot of shady shit. Like, he has to go to prison. Like, that's the ultimate fate of, like, the law catches up to him eventually. Like, that's just that's just how it has to go. I'm with and you. I'm I, like, I, I'm like, yeah. some way this has to involve the law at the end. I, it's like, as the show was progressing, though, it's like, Joe, I don't know if we can get him in the courtroom like you want. Like, it might be something different. <laughs> but then when he ends up in the courtroom, I was like, you win, Joe. Like, he called it from I the did. start of the season. I even, he I had it in mind. He was going to represent himself. Yeah, honestly, I was like, "There's no way he'll represent himself." But I, to be yeah. fair, Bill Oakley from the top rope out of fucking nowhere showed up and made yeah. it more oh believable. My God. <laughs> it did, but you know what? It's still good. He it was co-counsel. Still yes, counts. It was very good. No, you, you got it. You yeah. got it. It was uh, a very but, stressful episode to watch for a final mm-hmm. episode because with other final episodes, I feel like usually you know. No, think about this. You're watching a TV show. You're going into the final episode. Mm-hmm. Generally, you have an idea of what that final episode is going to be, either because it's the thing the entire show has been working towards, or, I mean, obviously you saw it set up in the episode before. Yeah. You like, don't. For example, like, like do. Avatar, like, obviously the last episode, he's going to fight the fucking Fire Lord. That's what mm-hmm. the whole show's about. And, like, Breaking Bad, like, okay, we saw the fucking machine gun. He's going to go machine gun some motherfuckers. This show, <laughs> like, this this episode, even in the last, like, ten minutes, I was like, I, j- I don't know what's going to happen, and that was the scary part. And me. what's great, no, I'm with you. Joe seemed pretty confident of where I was going. I was like, I have no idea where we're going, but, you know, when we get to the end, I'm like, I get it. It, mm-hmm. it clicks in your head. It's like, I see how we got here. Um, yes. And that's what you want from a show. You don't want it to come completely out of left field, like... Aang fighting the Avatar, right? Spoilers for Avatar, which all of you should have watched by now. But um, it's like, will Aang kill him? Because the whole story's kind of been building up to, like, Aang having to do this. And when, like, some people do have problems with Aang pulling out the spirit bending last second. But it's like, when you get to the end, it's like, no, this is what the show's been building up to. Because ultimately, what makes Aang special is that he finds that third path in, in this moral quandary and that's what makes him special as an avatar and i feel like now that i mention it something very similar could be discussed with how saw ends the series um yeah i wanted to touch on that especially because this not only the whole series but this this episode in particular at the start primes you for thinking like no it's it's not going to end the way it actually did like I don't know. He, he starts off the episode at his most Saul. You yes, know, yeah. He, he wants the power. He he'll, he'll do anything to win. And we are introduced to, in a sort, his, his antagonist for the episode. This guy is like, I've never lost a case. Yeah. So you know, the Shonen fan in me is like, Oh my <laughs> oh, god, boy. this guy's never lost a case, but Saul's power level is higher than <laughs> I told I told Willer it was reverse Phoenix right at this moment. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it this. really was. And what's great is uh. Lawyer power levels is actually relevant for this discussion because Saul shows himself to be the strongest lawyer of all time in that court in that debate scene, which is a fantastic scene. That was you know, great. That's yeah. the thing. That's the start of the episode makes you think like, oh, you know, that's what's gonna happen is he's gonna get off scot free because that's what he always did, does. But that's the surface level, and you don't see what's going on behind that, where you know this whole time he's having to deal with these issues without even admitting to himself that he's dealing with it. What uh, is his time machine? What does he regret? Yes, yes. Dude, the the flashbacks and the time machine framing, like, it's so good. And some people yeah. might say it's unsubtle. Some people completely miss the fact that, like, the time machine regret was Chuck specifically. And, and Joe pointed out, like, no, it's specifically that scene with Chuck. Because I'll, that's the day before the se- the series starts. A lot of people have placed it there, and that's mm-hmm. crazy. Where like his time machine is episode zero. Like so much could have yeah. changed if he had mended his relationship with Chuck back then. Think about when Mike was asked. You know, if you had a time machine, when would you go back to? And you know, at first he's like, oh, you know, I'd go back to you know the day his son died because yeah. that's the obvious answer. Him, but then he's like, no, you know what? This all started when I took my first bribe. That was such and, a, what a good first scene. Oh, it really set know, the tone. As soon as it, it, it as soon as it dawns on you that the episode is trying to figure out what this is for Jimmy, what mm-hmm. is the moment that he would have to go back to? Just like 
Mike, I, you know, I feel like there's a lot of obvious answers, like before he took the millions of dollars from the cartel, any number of things, but because those are the things that have been happening the past few seasons. But um, when you really think about it, that's kind of like that's where Jimmy would have to go back to is back to his brother, because I, that's what led to all this yeah, in I, a way. Yeah, I uh, I want to talk about like how genius I think the last four episodes of this show are. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because, so and I realized this. And I meant to tell this to you as like a spoiler, Willer, so I could have it written down somewhere. Okay. And, but like the the last four episodes are like a like a condensed timeline of of Jimmy McGill, Saul Goodman, and Gene mm-hmm. in those yeah. four episodes. Because so like we go we're, we're going through the entire series, and this was pointed out to like me and Willer from a Reddit post where like each season has had 10 episodes except for this one and on the 10th episode like which is the ended. first gene episode yeah is it the first gene episode the 10th episode yeah oh, okay yeah on that episode it has a very picturesque ending to it right like yeah. uh, Saul even ends like his last line of the episode is like huh after all that a happy ending and I'm like where the fuck is this show going yeah <laughs> and right. so like I think and I think a big part of what they were trying to show there is like that was Jimmy McGill's last, like, big slip. Like, his last big, like, kind of con man scheme kind of deal that he set up, he executed, and got down. Like, we see him give the fucking cinnamon roll to Jerry. We see him <laughs> practicing, like, the run through the department store with the silly lines. Like, it's very Jimmy McGill. And it ends with, like, him h- hanging up his stuff. And, like, that would have been a fitting ending if this entire show was about Jimmy McGill. Yeah, like, I, 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 a quick sidetrack. I also think episode 9 would have been a fitting ending where Kim leaves and it just hard cuts to Saul being scummy yeah. Saul. So, like, we yeah. had two back-to-back, like, this is a good stopping point. Why are we still going? And, like, that yeah. that's the point almost. Yeah. And, like, so we, we get to this, like, perfect Jimmy McGill, like, stopping point. Like, I think, I feel like if that was the last episode of Better Call Saul, people would still be pretty satisfied. But I think the point they're trying to make here is that, like, Saul, Jimmy at this point is no longer Jimmy. He's past this. Like, he's yeah. this is this is nothing to him. And then we get two episodes of him being Saul Goodman, setting up the, the identity fraud scheme, breaking yeah. into, like, which people's is, houses. One of the most reprehensible things Jimmy's done is that scheme, which, by, by the time we got to the final episode, it's like, why am I still cheering for this guy to get a good ending like he does not deserve it um and then it's and and it and he goes through the whole saw thing and then the very last episode the first like third of it he's very much back to being gene he's on a run he's scared the cops all the way up to the point where he's thrown into a prison and he's trapped just like he was in like season two or three when he was locked out of the uh the trash can yeah that that is the the scene of season two the, the gene scene season two like remember, if like it looks just like it, when he's sitting on the floor, he's stacking this like concrete like room, and I and uh, and just writing him he wall. he writes S G was here on yes. the wall there, and then he sees my lawyer will ream your ass, which uh yeah I've <laughs> I've I have since figured out that it is a gay joke for Bill Oakley, and that's why he thought of him, which is so funny <laughs> and so Saul. Yeah, and then that's the turning around point because now he like he hits his valley of going back into Gene, and then he turns back into Saul Goodman, and then he goes and redeems himself as Jimmy by the yeah. end of that episode. I think that's just a really good like small arc that takes place at the very end there that really encompasses like what this whole story is trying to tell is that like you can eventually like if you realize what you're doing, you can eventually back up. You're going to take consequences for it, but you can you can get back to like who you were before before all of this i i think a Uh, very important framing device to understand the ending and understand why they because i think there was three viable endings that they could have chosen with and they would have all been pretty good there's the ending mm -hmm. where he throws kim under the bus um there's the ending where he takes the seven-year deal um and then like it just is what it is there's also the ending where he dies and then there's the ending we got and Mm -hmm. i think a very important thing about why they set it up this way is the concept of the bad choice road that's introduced mm-hmm. formally in season five in the episode bad choice road but it's been the thing all along and and it really pins back to mike 
the the day that Mike would go back to was the day he got on the Bad Choice Road, and Mike stayed on that road until the day that Walter White killed him, and he never left, and he could just continuously got worse and more numb, because once you're on that road, you need to make a drastic decision to get off of it, and mm. like look at what happened to Saul, look uh, sorry to to Walt and uh, Mike, like they both stayed on that road for better or for worse and they died on that road and, um gus the, too actually if we want to talk yeah. about gus's ending which i thought was a great scene but people were like this is a boring scene gus had an opportunity after he killed lalo with his bare hands uh <laughs> to like actually indulge in life a little bit go go fuck the cute wine boy go drink some nice wine go have some fun right but like Gus ends up, like, repressing that immediately and being, like, back to business. And that is the tragedy of Gus. He is so devoted to revenge. That is his bad choice road. And he never deviates from it. And he just goes on that path until he dies. Yeah. Like, I think there's a lot of messaging about this. This Like, you need to really make a drastic... Like, these kinds of characters that we're dealing with, they are very good at crime. And it takes very big decisions to mm-hmm. actually change their life. Um, which... and, and also it's like the size of the hole they dig because like the deeper you go into that hole, the more you have to do the crawl out of it. Yeah. For like, And sometimes you get to a point where like the only thing you can get out of from crawling out of that hole is your own like self-redemption. Like you look at Walt, Walt like going in there's like, I know I'm going to go, at best, I'm being sent to prison for life. Yeah. At worst, and like, so at it's like I'm he dying. went and, yes. So he knows he's going in to die. He knows what he has to do. He has to go make up things with Skylar. He has to have one like, futile talk with his son. Yeah. Uh, so at the end, it's just like, I have to get all my guilt out in front of everybody, and especially Kim, uh, for everything that I've ever done in my life. Yeah, like, um, that's the whole, like, it, it's it's not going to be easy. Which, okay, let's talk about the elephant in the room. The thing that people really dislike about this episode is the fact that he didn't take the seven-year deal, and he instead is going to spend arguably the rest of his life. Some of the writers think he'll get out. Some of the writers think he won't. I I personally think he'll get out when he has like just a few years of life left because you can't make yeah. that that deal. Uh, but mm-hmm. I mean, what's what's the point at that point? You know, but um, like, how do y'all feel about the fact that he? could have had seven years why didn't he take the seven years there's the argument that like we could have had the same ending but he took the seven years so like uh, how do y'all feel about that because that is the main sticking point with the people that don't like this episode you know i wonder if it's a sort of self-imposed punishment for the chuck thing that you know he was reminded hey that's not actually a crime and he immediately and firmly is like yeah it is it is yeah um, so maybe that's his way of atonement or, you know, trying to make good. I don't know. I think it's just, I think there's like 400 levels of complexity to this. Because <laughs> yeah. I think from one angle, you can look at it as that, like, he tries to win Kim back one more time and it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can look at one angle where he realizes, like, all of his shenanigans it was okay they were hurting other people until it started hurting Kim, which it would have happened if he didn't take the Howard blame. Um, it could have, you could look back and maybe he thinks to himself, like, just what am I doing with my life? I think, like, it ultimately comes down to, like, I think, I think it, to me, it's like ultimately, like, I just realizing that, like, oh, all the choices I've made have, are going to end up ruining Kim's life, and I can't live with that. That's the one guilty thing I can't live with is so ruining her life jimmy confessing there does not necessarily exonerate kim and that is a sticking point to the episode as well yeah. because it's a civil suit so but when we see her it doesn't seem like her life is actively being ruined already by the civil suit and we can assume that some time has passed so here's what i think happens right jimmy mm-hmm. takes the full brunt and cheryl howard's wife can live with the fact that someone took the actual capital punishment for mm-hmm. like the the by the books punishment for Howard's death. It's not about the money for her. She's rich as fuck. It's about yeah. someone someone's head rolling, you know, and she got mm-hmm. that. I still think she will sue Kim, but she's not going to destroy Kim's life. It's it's she's going like she has uh she has mostly satisfied by Jimmy admitting to it. And going to prison for it for eighty nine for eighty seven years, uh, which Ooh. is excessive as shit. 
So it's like, I think she'll still go after Kim, but it's something that Kim not only wants, but can handle. Kim wants absolution. Yeah. Um, yeah. She wants she wants penance for what she's done. So, okay. That's the thing. Like, whenever she comes to Cheryl of her own free will to lay out all the crimes, mm-hmm. Cheryl, I mean, is like, okay, well, I could sue and take everything you have and ruin your life. And Kim's like, yeah. Yeah, that is that is the price I pay. I remember a line Jimmy dropped on Howard in one of his cruelest scenes in the show where Howard is uh, starting to think that he's responsible for Chuck's suicide and Jimmy hits him with the, well, Howard, that's your cross to bear. And Ooh. by the end of the season, a lot of crosses are being bared and, and that is the cruel irony. But here's my take on the ending, okay? I think to truly understand the ending, you need to really understand what the last three episodes were communicating about the nature of Jimmy McGill. Mm -hmm. Jimmy McGill is the kind of person who cannot really handle emotional trauma. His coping mechanisms are extremely destructive. There are cons, there are crimes, there are lies. And that's been the case the entire series. Think of like season four, Jimmy, after his brother's death. It's almost impossible to truly figure out what's going on in his head. And I like, we watched those episodes together and we would bring up, it's like, what is Jimmy thinking in this scene? And it just happens so many times, um, all the way to the end of the show. Like he is repressing so much guilt. I've gone about how like guilt is kind of the overarching theme of both shows. And you Mm -hmm. can, you can label it as like the regret time machine as well. You can label it as sins, but how these characters deal with these sins, for example, Walt and the amazing episode fly and how he's avoiding them and how he holds on to them for most of the series. Right. So it's like Mm -hmm. Jimmy's nature is that, Hey, I'm, I'm in uh, Omaha. I'm upset that Kim, I, I called her. She still wants nothing to do with me. She told me to turn myself in. Fuck her. I'm going to get back into it. He had the out. He finished the thing with Jeff and he went back in. And Mm -hmm. that is why the seven year plan does not work. Um, yeah. because once he gets out, Jimmy has not truly addressed his core problem. He's going to go back to grifting. And the key moment, I think, is that in the last episode, with his own bare hands, he was about to kill a cancer patient and an innocent old woman, and he snaps out of it the last second. Then he goes into survival mode, but hearing that Kim was big enough to actually redeem herself and come clean is the last little breaking point. Like, he came to do the most evil thing that he was about to do in the entire show. He stopped himself. He saw that Kim can get better, and he's like, there's no more running, honestly. Like, after these seven years, what's really going to change? I can't keep living with this eating away at me. I have to address it, or I'm always going to be this this person that I am, this self-destructive person. Which is why, ultimately, I think he comes clean and absolves his own soul at the cost of the rest of his life. And that's my take. Um, Which is why I think the ending works well. I really like the view that, you know, this show is about Jimmy avoiding guilt for the things he's done by doing the one thing he's good at. And he has been avoiding guilt. Like, that was, like... That that was the moment in the courtroom is when he finally adv- admitted guilt for the Chuck thing. And, yeah. you know, like, why is this the method he uses to avoid his guilt is grifting? And, like, you think about it, at the beginning of the show, he was at the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. He had nothing. And you want to know what, what the only thing that got him out of that situation was? Oh. Grifting. And, yeah. I mean, you know, he did good work on the side, but even with the you know senior uh, the seniors he was working with he was grifting them too eventually and it's like you get to this point where that's what got him out of the rough situation in his life and whenever he's facing guilt for these things he's done he can look at all of the money he's raking in and in his mind someone who's been pulling these grifts ever since he was you know like a teenager probably yeah i mean in his mind it's like if i'm making all of this money how am I a loser? Like, this is good. These are good things I'm doing. It's, and it's a way for him to avoid guilt. He's such a complex character because it's like, 
I'm, I'm like going against Chuck. I'm proving Chuck that he's wrong because I can make it. But really, Chuck, he's proving Chuck that he's right, and that is something that he has to deal with. Um, it's like if if what I'm doing is wrong, then why is my life getting better every time I do mm -hmm. it? And that, at that point, he has to. That that's what's so difficult about the situation he's put himself in as a character, because the only way for him to break free of this is to admit that these griffs that are making his life better and making him richer, he has to stop, he has to accept guilt, and he's yeah. got to turn himself in. Well, and he couldn't do that until the very end. Th think how fast Gene escalated to the worst version of the character that we've Woo! seen so far. It was it was like a matter of weeks. Like it, All these griffs are getting him more money, but it is slowly corrupting him and killing his it soul. It really is like an addiction, because whenever he was in his groove as Gene, just working at Cinnabon, he actually seemed all right. Yeah, but he's a good manager, like, too. He's like, all the girls like, like someone, him. Like a, like a smoker who, you know, has a cigarette dangled in front of him after being clean for a year. The first time that What's-His-Name came up to him and is like, hey, I want to get into the scene, Saul, like, Saul immediately goes, like more into the grifting than he ever has before yeah it's like clearly it's getting worse and it it, it just had to like think of what happens when a post seven year prison Saul gets out with no money bad reputation and no kim what do you think he's going to do to get by in life like ju just watch six seasons of this show and, and, like, if you believe that the seven years was the choice he should have made, what do you actually think a bottom-of-the-barrel Jimmy is going to do? He's going to grift harder than ever before and yeah. actually end up killing people and hurting people in irrevocable ways. It's it's, no, gonna, it's gonna get bad. The presidency. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, he is insanely good at lawyering. Like, oh my god, yeah. his power levels are so high. And a formative memory, uh, to jump off of what Bradley said, for Jimmy... Is that moment when, as a kid, he saw his dad getting grifted by the dude who told him about the wolves and sheep mentality that he's kind of mm -hmm. kept his whole life. He's like, I'm going to stay a wolf because that is one way to get through life, and it is consistent, and it works for me, and I want to be a wolf, not a sheep. Um, and by the end of the story, look at where that's got him, you know. Uh, one, one scene I want to make sure I bring up is the scene where he walks into the courtroom with the church song, which is, a, as I mentioned, a very Kino scene, but... Oh. The, the song is a church hymn that's going like, all things are possible if you only believe. And as I'm watching that scene the first time, I'm cringing because it's like, oh, this dude's such a douchebag. Everyone's looking at him at court with his silver suit. He looks so bad. And the things that are possible if you believe is the fact that Slippin' Jimmy is about to do the biggest slip of his life. He's about to get off with only seven years. I can't believe it. But really what that scene means is is all things are possible if you believe that the character you've always wanted to make the right decision, because Jimmy's always had good in him, and I've always cheered for him, and like, come on, Jimmy, just this one time, do the right thing. But if it, there's a miracle that happens, if you believe it, Jimmy McGill can finally make the right decision. And, like, retroactively knowing that that's how the song could be interpreted makes that final stretch of the episode just all the better. Um, mm -hmm. Woo! Uh, scene with Kim is great. I don't want to spend too much time because we're reaching our time here. Oh, jump to the okay. You, I did cry. We do have to I talk about it. I did cry during that scene. That scene was so good. I mean, obviously, yeah. parallel to episode one. From the yeah. moment we met Kim in this show, the question is obviously, okay, where does Kim go between mm -hmm. breaking call? No, like, better, where, like, where does Kim go at the end of the show? Yeah. And what actually happened was, like, both better but also more tragic than any answers i came up with because like i'm thinking like oh you know either like she gets killed or you know she divorces jimmy and we just never hear from her again but what actually happened like if i was jimmy what actually happened would probably break me worse than either of those realities the color is mm -hmm. also gone from her life that is like the key point she it's pointed out that she does not make a single decision in her alternate life until she makes the decision to join like the lawyer agency as a volunteer Dude, she's just depressing me so much whenever people are just like even stuff like is the food good and she's, she's like, like oh. i guess like, she's so afraid of like agency at this point of her life 
and it's like, what happened to my girl boss? What happened? She's dead. It's so good. Um, also, the scene with Walt, real quick. It's so it was so good to see Walt being just an insufferable dick again. Oh, <laughs> he's so good at it. But when he's asked about his time machine moment, the first thing he does is look at the watch Jesse gave him, which is his true regret that he also avoids. It's, it, it's his chuck. It's his grifting. But then he goes on with the more surface level, ego funded gray matter answer, which I think is very interesting. Like they improved Walt. Uh, they improved Jesse. They've improved Marie. Ma- fucking Marie shows up and she gets like a cool send off. Cool. Um, mm-hmm. Such a good ending, man. Uh, I mean, uh, I'll open up for any last things y'all want to bring up about the up about the ending. But these are my main points and why I think it works is that whole story they've been telling about the bad choice road and and the things with Gene. But I. I I just, uh, to cap it off, I'd say it was a very satisfying finale for me because, I don't know, it created this situation where the only path for him to move forward as a person is to totally reject the path he's put himself on his entire life, Mm -hmm. the one that making him successful and rich and free. So, I don't know, I thought that was amazing how they did that. Joe? I still can't believe Howard's dead. Oh, dude, like, the, I think the most memorable scene in the show, aside from maybe the ending, is going to be Howard's death, <laughs> like, for sure. Like, the, I was, I, I like, <laughs> it's still surreal. Like, that whole scene is surreal. Like, uh, as, as, like, a quick side note, what makes that scene so cool is, like, Jimmy's two sides of his life don't cross over very often. Imagine if, like, he crossed over with the cartel side very frequently. That scene would have less mm-hmm. impact because it's like, well, it's bound to crash, but, like, it, it's done so it's just it's done frequently enough to where they crash it makes sense but you didn't see it coming um, yeah and that's great um but i thought the ending was great i i thought it was like it's not flashy like breaking bad but this was yeah. this isn't the flashy show yeah breaking and bad's I a more straightforward that. ending uh but i think they're both very yeah. good endings yeah. uh, i All mean right. people that's... thought breaking bad had an underwhelming ending but yeah okay we got a tier list to do <laughs> I don't, I don't know who these people are, but Where I guess is. they just can't read Where, books. Is this the one with too many characters? Th- which one do we want to do? This one. The the first one? I think so. All right. Okay. okay. We're going to do it. We're going to make a Breaking Bad tier list. Uh, <laughs> I don't think anyone's below D, to be honest, but we'll see. I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if anyone's going to end up in the bottom one. All okay. right. Lydia. Okay, I like Lydia A tier. I like her her like top left, top left. She's the first one. Uh, I like her how neurotic she is. She's super entertaining as a character. Yeah, yeah you know, it, I feel like when she comes on screen, I'm like, god damn it, Lydia. Even though like, <laughs> there's not really a reason for that. I smile she... and get a migraine every time she's on the screen. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and she shows up uh, briefly in Better Call Saul, and that was great. Okay, who next? Okay. <sighs> Huel. Oh, dude, everybody <laughs> loves Huel. Huel's got to be on the screen here. He's Huel. fucking hilarious, dude. That's my associate, Huel. He will <laughs> testify if you place the battery in your pocket on your way. Think about how many schemes in both shows wouldn't have been possible without this think, dude. Think about how good his fingers are. Also, we yeah, got yeah. we got closure. Huel did not die in that room where Hank left him at the end of Breaking Bad. He got out Whoa. eventually. <laughs> thank God. I think B-tier is good for Huel. Uh... Ted, Ted's a solid B, too. He's a well-fleshed-out character. Maybe C. I don't know. What do y'all think? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll give him C. But but I, but I'll, I'll, I'll give him B. I'll give him B. But I fuck I, Ted. I, I, I fuck Ted, yeah. though. Ted is just the driver for Skylar to realize um, she's going down Bad Choice Road. But it's true, but, one. like, okay, we'll, we'll put him in C. Fine. We'll put him high C. High C. High, high C. Yeah. Uh, oh, my high C. Oh, uh, what's her name? <laughs> I, Andrea just has like a tragic death. She's oh, oh is that Brock's mom? Yeah, it's Brock's yeah. mom, Jesse's girlfriend. She has an awful death. Jesus Christ, That's, it's horrendous. Like it's like it is unfair. You know, entirely. it sucks how she went. But does she go below Ted? Like, how much is she really in the show? She goes yeah. below Ted, right? Yeah, I think uh, the, right there, the one good scene with her, she's like, "How dare you call me a junkie? I take care of my son." Which at the fir- I can I can relate to that, but also like you you are kind of also still a junkie. It, yeah. It's like it's a r- irresponsible mom who still loves her kid a lot kind of character. It's tough. 
Uh, That's kind of cool. Who next? Uh, Mark. Uh, that this is Bro. Jane's dad, who doesn't show up very much, but he, his actor gets a lot of emotion out of the scenes he is in. Yeah, like when he yeah. talks to the Walt in the bar. Yeah, that's yeah. a really... And then, like, seeing his lifeless eyes as he calls his 9-11 part two, and Walter's like, guys, it wasn't that bad. I can put him above Ted, maybe. Yeah, all right, we can fuck yeah, that's that. a weird. That's a weird moment in Breaking Bad, that that airplane crash. You know, it, Bradley, it old. Bradley also was, funny. like, weirded out by it. It's like, well, okay, we're not going to put this on Walt, are we? <laughs> I remember you mentioning yeah, that. It, it was a little weird because... Uh, it, it, it has the it's like a double-edged uh, double-edged sword not the right term but it's like yeah like it wouldn't have happened unless walt did what he did but at the same time like when he was making it's, his decision he didn't know he was gonna make a play it's, crash. it's such that an might, extreme that might have changed his decision yeah it, it, it feels like a one to 100 moment where it's <laughs> like it's just like okay well hold like, on if you is... told him a plane was gonna crash I, I bet he'd be like okay i'll at least think about it a little bit longer. <laughs> He'd still yeah. do it, though. Uh, Tortuga... I, I do like it, because it, it, it shows... It's a, a fun mystery. That Walter, it, yeah, it, like, it's, it's the ripple effect of, like, putting the bad influence in the world and how it creates more bad things happening to other people. You know um, I do like that. It's just... It's like just so over-the-top it crazy. Is, I mean, Breaking Bad, despite being, like, slow by most show standards, still has its flashy fucking moments. Uh, oh, yeah. Tortuga's not really a character. He's just there to have his head decapitated. Yeah. Uh, speaking of not characters, how do we feel about the twins? Which, by the way, I didn't mention. Joe and I went to Breaking Bad th- trivia. We got second. The team that beat us was a family of four called Team Kettleman. We had no fucking chance. Just think of, like, the amount of Breaking Bad content that they would consume. Uh, yeah. But we got a solid second. But one of the characters was like, what is the second twin's name? It's like Mar- Marco, and we're like, oh, Who the God. Who knows that? It's, it's Leonel. <laughs> so yeah. now Who you know. Who would know that? Uh, I think the twins are A-tier. Really? At, at least yes. I was gonna put him at least mid to high B. I think that I, I think gonna... B is B, like I, they can. They're so unique. They're they're fucking western yeah. like bad guy characters that exist in this fleshed out world. They feel like the most anime characters in this live yeah. action show. But like at the same time, like Better Call they, Saul adds I, so much to them with so little. Yeah, actually, yeah. I think what the twins do, which I think really accomplished it more than like. Uh, the mark who who is like representation of like th- putting the bad stuff into the world and like shit happens. The twins are like the actual physical embodiment of the strength and like power of the cartel. Like they are yeah. they are like the Darth Vader of the cartel. Where it's like you see these two, they're going to come and just you're you're basically dead. I like, really they think are- they fit a good niche in the Salamanca family, too, where it's like, you got yeah. the scheming uncle who's rotten to the core, you got Crazy Tuco, you got the stoic twins, and you got charismatic as fuck, brilliant Lalo Salamanca, and, like, they make a fun yeah. little quartet. Dude, and you know what? I think they are a good example of something that's not praised enough, especially in live-action mm-hmm. shows that are in very grounded environments. Costume design. Yes. yes. Because in, in a show like this... gold and silver over here, Pokemon. <laughs> yeah. like, a, lot of, a lot of people might look at a show like this and be like, what costume design? They're all just wearing normal clothes. And I'm like, they they do so much work yeah. to make what looks like an everyday outfit tell you so I, much about the oh, and you, The exception is the twins. They, are, they just look badass. I can picture their boots in my head. Right now. <laughs> the yeah. skull boots. I want, I want a 15-minute short. Oh, my... Is, Yes. Just a day in their life. Like, what is their conversation when they wake up in the morning and go, like, what suits are we wearing today? Oh, uh, <laughs> they don't. Always you, matching. You think they like, talk? They just nod at each I, other and they're like, yeah, gold, I think, silver. I think they pull off a suit and then, like, they show it and they either nod or shake their head and they put it back on. Like, I just want, like, just a small interaction of, like, I, with their day in life. I really want to see what they're like at dinner time and then when they relax yes. at night. Well, oh, my God. They're like. The pizza man knocks on the door, they open it, they're standing side by side. It's not clear which one actually turned the doorknob. The pizza man says that'll be 2150. They don't say a word. They turn and look at each other simultaneously. They look back. One of them pulls out a plastic bag with a roll of money in it and puts a finger up to his mouth and takes it. Bro, I didn't know you were Peter Gould and Vince Gilligan. <laughs> like, you're incredible. Uh, but that's how good these characters are. It really uh, is. Uh, Kubi is didn't show up in Better Call Saul. That that he gets put in C. He's one of Saul's henchmen. He is Bill Burr. He's cool. He's funny. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, Crazy 8. Crazy 8 actually shows up in Better Call Saul for a brief uh, amount in uh, Season 3 and 5, where he goes to jail in Season 5. Just a little bit. And, uh, and he's, he gets beat, the shit beat out of him by Nacho in Season 3 because Hector makes him. Tough times for this guy. He's... Bill Burr? No, not Bill Burr. <laughs> uh... Crazy 8. <laughs> oh, yeah. Maybe below Brock's mom or something? Fire. Fire. I mean, yeah. No, no, he's not a D-tier character, but you know who might be? Who might be? No. Is there? No. no. Uh, combo. <laughs> combo might be a D-tier character. He's just yeah. kind of there. Like, because all of Jesse's other homeboys got something going for him. Combo's mm-hmm. just kind of sitting there. Which, Skinny, skinny Pete, A-tier? Yeah. Skin- <laughs> Bradley, do you remember, like, how much of a fucking bro Skinny Pete is in El Camino? Oh. <sighs> They men- the, that, was, that was he was one of the stars of the show in that movie. He really was. They mentioned the fact that they found Pinkman's car at the border, right? And uh, Francesca says that in her call with with Saul. That skinny Pete, him and Badger made that plan to drive the car down to the to the border. And you know what? Fuck it. I love Badger, even though he's a fucking Badger. idiot. He's so funny. He is Badger. He's not the brightest, but he's a good man. He's a great uh, character uh, comic relief. I could settle for a oh, B yeah. for him, but. I think a. I think both of them belong in A. Like they have a whole Resident Evil Four discussion. Uh, oh man! The, the scene of Badger sitting on the bench and he's like, "You have to tell me you're a cop." Is so funny. So to fucking me. funny. Oh my it's god! It's so good. That's a uh, great episode. That's Better Call Saul, actually. That, that is that episode. That is Better Call Saul. Um, oof! Someone pick for me. Who we doing? Uh, Werner Herzog or her uh, bottom. Werner, I, I love Werner. He he's got a, he's like a he's so cute and like he's he's such a tragic character. I yeah, I think it goes back to like like he to like he to me is a more representation of like of like just I don't know like going down that bad choice road kind of thing. Like he tries to get out earlier, but he still gets punished for it. And like sometimes you just he didn't fall fully into... know he was in the bad choice road. He was like, I'm in a sketchy yeah. road. He didn't realize how bad it was until Mike yeah. has to kill yeah. him. And he's such a mm-hmm. great character for Mike's character development. And when we met his wife, we're like, oh, she's great. No wonder one risked it all for another night with Marguerite. She's like a super charming yeah. German, like very intellectual. She was like Lolo. Yeah. Dude, L- Lalo, we're going to talk about Lalo, but Lalo really did not want to kill her. And I think that is very important oh, yeah. for that. Like, he really was, I feel like he he, he actually genuinely liked her as a person and was like, man, mm-hmm. don't make me kill you. Um, man, what's I can't, this, wait, can't what's believe this, that's a, who's, this, who's this woman next to the Kelmans? Top row. Uh, Paige, dude. Uh, Kevin and Paige are at least B tier. So they're the lawyers that are constantly in Kim's life. Like, they work for Mesa Verde. They're, like, super uh, supportive they, for Kim. I think they're super yeah. fleshed out, despite the fact that they're not really important to the show. I think they they're not lawyers. They're, they're in the they're the banks, people. They're right. Right. Yeah. I, I think Paige is a bank lawyer, or I don't know. No, I think, I think Paige is, like... Hank, it's his name's not Hank. What is it? Kevin, it's the side sitter. Kevin, I think I think he's Kevin's like secretary or like yeah, advisor. Yeah, you're right. Like, I don't know, but, but they're the big people. I I've, think they're a really strong like B plot line that was happening with Kim and really like showcasing her career growth and they, what she was dealing with. They've been relevant since season two, and they show up like pretty frequently. I really like them. Uh, I'm gonna. I do too. Yeah. And adding on to another character in that tier, where where's the boy? Schweikert, Shrike, uh, Richard Schweikert yeah. is like Kim's old boss. He's also the first antagonist of the show because he's yeah. representing Sandpiper and we're like, this guy's such a dick, but he's just doing Lori things. I think he's super like well fleshed out as well as like he, he clearly has a personality. He's very level headed. Um, the, the actor's great. He's such a tiny little man. I love him. I might put him above his fellow lawyers. I feel like he got more prominence. Well, those are lawyers, so. <laughs> all right, all right, smart ass. Dude, where the fuck is Cliff Maine? Mm. Cliff's the go. Uh, I love Cliff. There's a, there's a lot of cool ass people missing off. All the right, moving on. Uh, who next? Let's talk about Ron uh, Jr. Okay, uh, you, mean, uh, you mean Flynn? Yeah, we sorry. Let's let's talk about Flynn. <laughs> <laughs> tough Man, character. Yeah, this is kind of tough, isn't it? My initial thought is like low B, high C. Like that's my initial thought. That I think 
high B. And the th- there's a lot of awkward humor that comes from Flynn, and there's also just a lot of awkward scenes just because it's like you're not used to like a cere- cerebral palsy character on screen, and he's like a, a semi burden yeah. to Walter's life, and there's, there's always that under tension where like Walt, Walt has to work so much harder. Because, like, of Walter Flynn. Uh, Walter Flynn, Jesus Christ. But I also, like, I like his rebellious streak. And what I really like about Flynn is the very last few episodes when he holds the knife against Walt and when he takes the phone call from Walt. Those are scenes that, like, mm-hmm. really elevate that character for someone who's going to grow up resenting his father so hard. Yeah. I, and he, he always represented the other side of the what if Walt gets caught scenario because. Mm. For Walt, there's the obvious pain of like, yeah, you'll get arrested, but Walt loves his family so much. He really does. And the pain with getting caught, only half of that pain is getting caught. The other half is what would his son think about him if his son knew what kind of person he was. Walt hardly cares about getting caught. It is 100% about how his family is going to react. Oh, yeah. So I think top of B is good for Flynn. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh... I also think it like like you said, it's just like it's it's just one more like pound on Walter's back with the lung cancer thing. Exactly. And it's like it's just like, oh my god, like just just there's so much shit on this guy's life. It um, it, it is it, it it feels bad to say insult to injury because Flynn's a great kid. Yeah. So like but you can see that Walt it, it is something that is in the back of his mind. I think through the acting of their scenes and, like, the scenes of Flynn getting bullied and Walter having to, like, stand up for himself and, like, be like, no, you're not going to take that, Flynn. Like, it, it's – there's a lot of layers to the relationship. I also really yeah. love the scene where um, Walter calls Flynn Jesse because, like, those are his two sons. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, oof, that's a tough scene. And Flynn's just like, what? Uh, <laughs> let's do Gale like you mentioned. I think Gale's a tough pick for me as well. Yeah. What are y'all feeling? It, Gale's a weirdo. Like, because he, like, he gets into this business for his own, like, personal, like, like, he doesn't even want to make money. He just wants to make good math, which is weird. No, like, you know, he, <laughs> he does want to make money, I think, because, like, there's a layer to it where it's like, someone's going to do this, and I'm going to at least make sure they have good math. Like, they're, they're, it's, like, two-sided. Yeah. I think that's interesting. He's cool. Like he is not who you'd expect to be the the, the cook, you know, or maybe he, it is. I he, don't know. He is he is what you would ideally think Walter White would want in a son slash like a partner. Partner, yeah, like, exactly. If if it wasn't it, for his big fucking ego, this would be the perfect partner yes, for Walter White. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I you know what? I think he's got to be B, right? I just don't know where. Maybe low B. Uh, yeah, put him below Schweiker. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. All right, all right. Uh, yeah. Okay, I want to talk about Stacy. I think oh. Stacy is uh, this is Mike's um, daughter-in-law. She's got a very good intro. She's got very good scenes, but she's just kind of there to be someone that oh, Mike yes. disconnects from. So I actually think she's one of the weakest characters in Better Call Saul. Even though I love yeah, the actress she... and I like the scenes where she's in. Yeah, she like disappears. I would say she's C. I yeah. I, would, I would say she's like. I... I feel like they Hello, like pretty, I, I feel like they drop her very hard in Better Call Saul. Like I feel like like after season three, she's like not seen at all. She, like, I mean, just, like, her best plot lines in season four though, when she's going to the therapy group with Mike, and then Mike uh, just like is that in season four? I thought that yeah. was in season three. Shit happens okay. in this show, man. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, but after that, she just barely shows up. It's more about mm-hmm. Kaylee and Mike's relationship, and uh, yeah, she's just not very fleshed out. Uh, dude, let's talk about the Kettleman. <laughs> God, I love no. Betsy. Yeah, yeah, we know Betsy. <laughs> Look, man, you guys were like, well, I don't know if Betsy's that hot, and then I showed you that gif, and you're like, all right. <laughs> uh, that, that's the thing. Whenever I, I was like, what? And then it, she definitely grew on me. <laughs> yeah, she's, yeah a grower, she she's a grower, all right. And then, you she know, Craig's super I, funny. I, I, would, in there. I think they're B. They're nice, like, very beginning antagonist for Saul, and yeah. like I think really like I think also they're kind of like the small spark in him that really like think about like well these people have been getting away with this shit for years and they're just they're they're going to take nothing for it basically like why don't I do this like that's really like there, the other thing too. There's a line from Betsy that I feel like haunts Jimmy for the rest of his life. It is 
Like or like in episode four, you're the kind of lawyer guilty people hire. Says the guilty yes. person. Oof. Yeah. All right. And I don't know. I think them as clients for Jimmy was, I think, just more entertaining to watch than, say, you know, the senior citizens. Because, yeah. like, mm-hmm. the senior citizens, at any time, he can decide, okay, I'm ready to start ripping these people off. And yeah. they probably, they, and they would trust him. But the thing, like, the Kettleman's, like, they know Jimmy is, like, crooked, like, the entire time they're working with him, but they're working with him anyway, and it makes a really fun dynamic any time they meet up. I also love them coming back in Season 6. It's a great way to wrap them back around. Yeah, I was not expecting them to come back. All right, let's talk about the Gus henchmen. Is that two? That's not two ghosts. Those are actually no, just that's, henchmen. that's Tyrus and, oh, my God. What is his that's name? That guy gets box cuttered. That's right? Tyrus and box cutter. I think you know, box cutter is better than Tyrus. Tyrus pisses me the fuck off, but I think that's the intent. The most I'll give them is I remember their faces. Yeah, I, I think like they serve as good like lap dogs and also push and pull to Mike, especially in Better Call Saul, as we see like Mike entering that business. I would say mm-hmm. they're low C with box cutter on top. You know mm-hmm. what's you know what is attractive to me about these characters is especially whenever like Ignacio would talk to them. Yeah. Because they are, they're just like him. They're usually working for the same people, depending on who Nacho's working for. And they're not at the top of the chain. So whenever they're doing stuff, I'm just like, just like Nacho, I'm like, what led them here? Like uh, they they could be just like him. Like what led them to this life? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's interesting, but, like, I feel like they're just more broken down. Like, they did, they don't have that sense of honor Mike started with and then slowly got eroded. Yeah. Let's talk about Ernie. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking oh, was that love Ernie. Yeah, fuck you, Ernie. Ernie. I said fuck you, Ernie, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. I don't even remember why. I don't know. Dude, you we were, were so we mean were, to Ernie. <laughs> we were, no, he's cool. He's a good boy. It was the scene where Chuck... <laughs> Took Ernie to the the copier, the photocopier thing to like try to prove that Jimmy had messed with the documents, and Ernie was like, "Chuck, let's go home." And Chuck y- told him to shut up, and we were all watching at the same time. And I went, "Oh, Ernie!" And, and then was like, yeah, like, "Yeah, fuck yeah, off, Ernie!" Fuck up, Ernie. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> Yo, Ernie is low key. Like, I think he's so lovable. He's low key a low A for me. That might be overreaching my bounds. So y'all, I I'd, I'd probably. <laughs> Keep him below Hewler the twins, but I do really. Yeah. Like, he's a good boy. He's a good boy. I wish Omar was here. He was there in the show briefly, but he was like Saul's uh, side guy when he worked at Davis and Maine. I would put him at the very bottom of B if I if it was me. Let's, That's let's, just me. Let's split the difference and put him above the. No, you're right. All right. Fine. Because it's like all these other people are like actual big players. <laughs> but Ernie though, he he brings Chuck the goods. Uh, we're, we're getting we're getting to the point where like it's a lot of good characters left. We can, all right, let's do Todd. Juan Bosa. Oh, oh no, Brad, Joe, you do not. You are not ready for what I have to say about Todd. Uh, That's so cool. Juan Bosa is like a cool middleman. He's always been kind of like meek, but he does keep the peace relatively yeah. well, considering how much these people fucking hate each other. You gotta hand Man, it to him. Imagine if Nacho shot Bosa in that scene. Like, Bolsa died. If Nacho you... shoots Bolsa, I think the cartel gets suspicious back on Gus. Like, Nacho needed to go out cleanly to ensure that his dad lived, is how I see it. I think it would have been, like, war in the streets. Like, the cartel versus Gus's men kind of a thing. It could and be. Uh, they, they would be super sus. I think Juan Bolsa yeah. is, like, a, a low B. I think he fits yeah. his role well. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe maybe high C? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> high C. No, no time, uh, to, no time to waste. Okay, uh, who's the most least character left? Neo Nazi man. You're right, Neo Nazi man. I think <laughs> uh, his name is Uncle Jack, and I think he fits okay. his. I think he fits his role as a final antagonist. Well, a lot of people don't like that Jack is the main antagonist of season five, but I really like him as a consequence of Walt's actions. I think I like him because. The writers would be like, we have to get someone that's worse than Walter White. Who's worse than Walter than White? Nazi. You know, but you know, he's not even worse than Walter. What do you think about it? I like the way Willer worded it, that like he's a result of Walt's actions. Because yes. in all of the other seasons, I'm like, like all the seasons to a degree have an antagonist. Like Walt 
is fighting against Tuco. Walt is fighting against Gus. Mm -hmm. But when it gets the, to this guy, I view it more as like Walt is struggling against the situation that he created for himself. Yeah. yeah. Which partially involves this giant gang of Nazis. Because like, because Gus and Tuco already exist in that ecosystem and Walt is trying to get into there. And then Walt has somehow got given, given the nurture and the the food for uncle jack to exist and low-key um i like his personality i think he's a he's funny he's kind of witty but he's also got gruff to him i, I yeah. think the actor played it well too i dare say he's like top of b low a which is a which i think it would be a hot pick to be honest i don't think people care about this character that much uh, <laughs> it's fine. I, don't, I don't know how high i'd put him I think he's in B. You sure. know, yeah, I, put him up, yeah, I could put him in high B somewhere above yeah, here, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can live yeah. with this. I, I like a scene where they are sitting at a diner and they're talking to Todd and like you you see him like from inside the diner basically and like they just look like normal people talking and it reverses the shot where you're on the table and you see all their Nazi tattoos. Yeah, that's like, a, that is fucked up. And the waitress is like uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. But it's, like, it's very much like a, you don't know that these people could actually be terrible people, like, just yeah. from looking at them. Yeah, it's because they're white. Uh, right. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's what the show's telling us. Uh, you know, yeah. this, the the vacuum guy, uh, he doesn't really get to do Hoover much. Man. Hoover Man's in C. Uh, I like his, uh, yeah, this is fair, this is fair, for his agency yeah. in the oh, yeah. I like him there. I really wish that Saul would have called Hoover Man in the last episode, and then his son or someone picked up, and, or like the phone's disconnected or something like that. Yeah, that uh, might have been what they would have gone with it if Robert Foster didn't die. Uh, but I, I guess it, it didn't matter either way. Um, oof. It's getting kind of peaky around here. A lot of peak characters mm. left. Let's do Jane. Uh, Jane. Yeah, Jane's, like Jane's got to be ace here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. At least. God, she's such a good... When she, like, turns on Walter and reverses the situation and, like, puppeteers Jesse, it is... You just feel bad. But you're also like, but Jesse loves her. Mm -hmm. And... And they reinforce in El Camino that, like, Jesse really, really loved this girl. Um, yeah. Because she even gets, like, a flashback in El Camino, which you should watch and at I some think, point, yeah. And I think also, like, Jesse feels responsible for her as well. Mm -hmm. Like, this is, like, the first character where, like, Jesse is, like, realizing, like, what he is doing is causing pain to people. Like, that's a big theme in, like, season two, I feel. Ruined her or, life. But she also... Yeah. He... he Right, he was toxic on her, like he was a poison to her. Mm -hmm. But she was pretty so willing just... to accept the poison, so. Yeah, I, I, I really like her. That's uh, tough. Right? I don't know. I don't... Bradley, you, you picked the placing. I would put her... Damn. She's you know good. what? I, I at least want to... I'm trying to figure out if she goes above or below Badger or something. I, I feel like she goes like... Below Lydia, if not above Lydia, I could go. Me. I could go right below Lydia, dude. No, you know what? No, I, I don't know. Is she below Lydia? Like, oh, I feel like Lydia is below a lot of these other people, in my opinion. Yeah, hold on. What, but, are we, what are okay, we I, I love Lydia. Also, I think she's very hot. If we're being quite honest, but <laughs> uh, we can keep her an A. Keep her an A. Keep her an A. Oh, she loves an A. It's just yeah. like. Here we go. Here and we go. Right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I like it. Perfect. It's good. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Oh man, it's getting good. Okay, uh, Tio. Oh, Hector. I, I think. Hector. I think. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What were we? When, when were we saying that again? I, this one's. We were watching the scene where um, Mike goes out to Hector <laughs> to see him. He was literally going to shoot them, and then Gus yeah. stops him. Yeah, kill and Hector. Do it. <laughs> And Bradley was like, kill him! Dude. Wow, so many memories are being unlocked as we talk about these characters. Dude, Hector's oh. gotta be A tier too. He's such a little shit. He's yeah. so rotten. And, he and really like, is the worst. And like, even, even his bell presence, you can feel it. When he shoots Nacho's dead body with his limp-ass hand, it is so upsetting. It was such an yeah. upsetting scene. Oh, man. <laughs> so did I say Lalo's dead, Nacho's dead body? I, mean, I, I, I really dies. like I would I would put Hector up in like eight like Briar Girl Soul I think elevates Hector a lot. It does, because you get to see when he like why he's so vindictive. Like he was actually mm -hmm. very high up in his family. He could do whatever the fuck he wanted back then. Yeah. Uh but where? I think he's I mean he's below Lydia for me, but 
I don't know. I think he's above all of these characters, honestly. So, in my opinion. I could put him... Mm, because, yeah. like, it's just... <sighs> He, shit, I, I, he shits himself in the DEA. This guy's a legend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that this also actor could emote so much as yeah. being a guy in a wheelchair with a bell is also <laughs> saying something. That's true. That's a great point. Bradley, how do you feel about that placement? That's the thing. I'm just trying to figure out if he goes, goes above or below Jane. I'll keep him there. I'll keep, yeah. I, I'll, I'll keep him right below Jane. Yeah. Oh, he's one of the best parts of the cartel plot line. <sighs> yeah. Like, ah, and he, he gets the final one up on Gus. Like, he really does. Ah, fuck it. Executive call. All right. Better call cool. executive. Okay. Who's next? Skyler. Go for me, Skyler. Man, people hate her. People hate this yeah. bitch, man. I. So I, 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 feel like I should correct something that we never got to talk about back to bad. Like at one point, I said I hated Skyler. But the reason I started hating Skyler was not because of the whole I fucked Ted thing. It's because. She was being a girl boss and was like moving out, was away from vault, doing her own thing, and then she's like, "Well, if he's actually doing the right thing, maybe I should help him with his drug cartel thing." Like, no, dog, do- do- you're misreading it, dude. You're you're completely misreading it, dude. She looks. She, there's a scene where she pulls out the money bag. The next yeah. scene, she's dressed in all green. Like, uh, speaking yeah. of costuming, the, you like could the see, Wunzler, dude. You yeah. could see the money signs on her eyes on that scene. It yeah. was incredible. That, and that that's the part where I started hating her. Like, that's the only reason. And then, but then I love how her whole plot line wraps up with Ted and him like breaking his neck and all that. I thought that was. Great. I think Skylar is based, but she's also cringe. <laughs> and, uh, I, I agree. I think you're right. I think she's at least top of A. I agree. Dare I say? Yeah. yeah, let's do it. I think she's just outside of the S rank because she is kind of a bitch. Like, let's be honest. Uh, but who isn't? Well, in, that's fine. Like, who who left on this list is not a bitch. Let's be honest. Like, <laughs> genuinely, no one. Uh, so it's it is what it is. And she also right. did sing "Happy Birthday" to Ted. So that's the thing. People will be like, "Skyler was such a bitch," and I'm like, that's "What about point. Walt, the main yeah. character, dude?" Yeah. <laughs> I think right, Skyler is very justified. Gomi is so yeah. lovable. Like, what a he, how come his death hits so hard, right? Like, it's it's all about that actor's charisma. Because when Gomi dies yeah. at the beginning of Ozymandias, he's just laying there dead. You're like, oh, Gomi. Like, yeah, he was, he was just only ever a guy trying to do the right thing. Yeah, he he also doesn't. Ha- he's not also like as morally compromised as Hank might be in some scenes. Gomi is yeah. just kind of like a a good cop. He has like. The machismo mm-hmm. that these cops do, but and and Gomi also like doesn't like overwork himself. Like he goes home at five o'clock and he's done. Like he, Hank like really buries himself in his work. Gomi's yeah. just like yeah, I go do my work. I like doing my work and then I go home and I, then that that's it. I got a wife and three kids to go to, as we see in Better Call Saul. I feel yeah. like he's a B somewhere, right? Yeah, I'd say yeah. He's like he will he will Uncle Jack tier. I agree. Tier. <laughs> I would say above. I like the uh, I, like, I just like the idea that we're saying like heel tier. <laughs> heel t- yeah. tier. Heel tier is a good tier. <laughs> That's a good. I want to be in that tier. What My heel gonna, levels are rising. What were we gonna say, Joe? I would say like I think either below Flynn or above him, in my opinion. Below I'll put Flynn. Him below. I, I think Flynn's got emotional death there that that yeah. can't be understated. We gotta do Marie at some point, man. Uh, speaking of bitches, <laughs> I. But I, I like her. I, I think her, I, one of the weakest parts of Breaking Bad a little bit is her side plot about stealing. But also I do think it ties into like she's not too unlike Walt with her impulses. But at the end of it, she's the only person left to truly hate Walt. So is it, that's kind yeah. of interesting when you think about it. Yeah. Um, like she is, she is the one that like gets hurt the most out of everything that happens in the show. That's true. It, that yeah. I mean, maybe Flynn. Maybe, maybe other than Walter Jr., like Flynn. Yeah. I think other than and Flynn's sister, who was well, a baby. Holly didn't get to meet her dad, so it's, yeah. I think it'll be a little better for oh, her. There is a there, so there's a scene where like they're doing a baby shower and they're like recording stuff oh. and and this is from like me having knowledge of like Breaking Bad and like where yeah. the show goes. And there's the scene where like they go up to Walt and Walt records something. I'm like, and that must be like one of, has to be like one of the most surreal and weirdest thing to like think back on. Holy like if shit. If you grew up as an adult, you, you look at like, which so like she opens up at 18. She wants like, there's her dad who is a known drug felon. Oh like, my. Probably I, like, 
I need that like, scene as a short. That sounds so powerful. <laughs> like it's it's like I just I remember watching like this is like a weird thought to have like knowing where the show goes like just uh like Holly will one day watch that video and see her father that she never met and like the only knowledge that she has of him is all the drug stuff and then he's just like Holly I've done everything for you oh. like it's 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 weird that's a, you just elevated that scene in my mind I haven't really thought about that yeah I, uh, that was the first thing I thought about when I watched that scene I was like holy shit this is so uh she also tells Walt to go kill himself which is so based you should just kill cool. yourself yeah. Walter yeah <laughs> that's the thing I would put I put Marie in A. I really like Marie. Ah, oh, come but, on. Nah. Like, she's really cool, but she's she probably ranks the lowest out of all the family members. Yes, for me. I, agree. I agree. I don't know, man. She stands up the Saul in the last episode. That that is a yeah. very good cameo to we be didn't like, even talk about that. That is such a good cameo. Alright, <laughs> yeah. fuck it. Alright, alright. I heard they found you in a dumpster. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that was shit, that so was good. good. Scathing. Yeah, we'll put her in a. Uh, as scathing as Walters. Oh, so you were always like this. <laughs> yes. Oof. All right, let's talk about Todd. He's our first S tier character. Oh, dude, so good. This Bre- is just peak people without a soul. Bradley, this is you one of me? the most. This is one of the just coolest written psychopaths I've seen <laughs> in fiction, because yeah. he is, he is probably just like the most morally bankrupt character. There's nothing Todd would not do. He's yes. not morally close to doing anything. But the crazy thing for him is that he is a very social person who genuinely values friendship. And yeah. like, yeah, he he would do any, like he would torture and kill people. But those very same people that he tortured, he genuinely would not understand why they wouldn't want to be his friend. <laughs> it's so good. Bradley. Like when he's talking to Jesse, when he's yeah. chained up. With the Holy ice cream? Shit. I brought you ice cream. Yeah, like, yeah. Okay, Bradley, there was El Camino questions at the trivia, which I was not expecting. They, <laughs> they asked, what are the name of Neil's uh, side characters? First of all, Neil's the guy that Jesse goes in a shootout with. I don't fucking remember Neil's name. I don't remember that. Let alone his fucking henchmen. Uh, I bet what, Team Kettleman knew it. Team Kettleman probably knew it. They're freaks. Um, but there's, okay, one of the questions was like, where's this scene, where's this song from in the series? And the song was the song that's playing as Todd drives his maid. That's all I'm gonna say about that scene. I don't know. If you, <laughs> oh my god! I don't know if you remember. I remember, what, I remember. That scene is deranged. Anyways, this character is S tier for sure. Oh yeah, Tuco. God, this guy want, scares me. <laughs> I want Tuco. A Tuco is, goes an S at least for me. I don't know about you guys. This was such a good moment in the show. This Tuco should have been Walt's wake-up call for mm-hmm. you don't want to be in this life. You don't want to do this. But instead, he kind of became Walt's manual. Like, oh the, God, the, yeah. the season after this, when he should be at, like, his most scared, like, oh, my God, I can't believe we got through that. Once he, he gets his own little henchman through the form of Jesse's friends, yeah. and he ha- he's like, I need to emulate Tuco. He's like, we have to intimidate like- these people. We have to make them fear they're going to die. I'm just like, holy shit. Walt emulating characters happens with every antagonist, actually, which is oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, it's so good. God, I, okay, fine. He can, I would put him in high A, but we can put him in S because or, also... Yeah, uh, I can and, live in either high A or bottom of it. In Better Call Saul, he's so good because he shows up and he legitimizes that show on a very crucial first episode. That show would not carry its weight if Tuco doesn't show up immediately and gives you promise of, we- like... I can't remember if we watched the first few episodes together, but I distinctly remember Bradley freaking out about Tuco showing up. In those we did first not. Few episodes. Uh, we we did the first ones, like kind of how we did the season finale, but we were like, oh, yeah. it, it'll be faster if we do it together. Um, <laughs> man, and then like I love his his interaction with Mike and how he goes to prison and then stays there until Breaking Bad. So fine, we can we can put him if, here if, or here. Yeah. If S gets too crowded, I could put him at the top. All right, he's tempted to. Honestly, if we're I don't want to spoil it, but S might Dude. get too crowded. S is probably going to get too crowded. <laughs> Let's put him at the top of A. Let's go ahead and do it. Yeah. I hope this is- <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, who, who is not S tier on this list? God damn. Uh, Let's start with Hank. I mean, Hank is S for me. I think Wait, Hank- who is still S. Like, that's the yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. I think Hank is a top three character from Breaking Bad for me. 
Yeah, I th- I went into Breaking Bad thinking like, oh, they're gonna make Hank like the super cop, but he's gonna be arrogant and asshole. So like, because you he want him to be like the overall antagonist of Walter White, so you need to have some sort of like negativity towards him. And the fact that they just actually made him a genuinely nice dude, he's a bit arrogant, but like he legitimately cares about his family. He legitimately cares about Walter, and he's just like he actively trying to be genuinely a- likes Walter. Like he, yes, he's he's a bully like, to him in a sense, but he genuinely cares. Like yes. if, he, if, if Gomi didn't exist, Walt would be his best friend. Oh my god! Yeah. What's, cra- yeah, what's he, crazy is they they are both Walt and Hank are family men. They like. To the death, they would do anything for their family, but that takes such different forms in both of them. Mm-hmm. It really does. Like, man, that's crazy. They they both genuinely love each other as family, and they're not related by blood. They are the yeah. husbands. That's crazy. Yeah, they're man. Not, they're and, he husband loves, and he loves Flynn. He's such a good uncle yeah. to Flynn. At points, he's a better dad to Flynn than Walt. Crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is kind it's, of a dick, though. <laughs> but that's he is a dick. <laughs> but like at the same time, it's like, yeah, but he's a super cop. Like what? Like I, he, he is genuinely amazing at his job. When he like gets yeah. in, in, when his life is at rock bottom. Sorry, mineral bottom, and he like <laughs> gets hard detective mode. He's great. He's fantastic. Yeah. Um, when he showed up at Breaking Bad, I was like, who fucking cares? Like it was. It's wild. Like if I watched the episode again, I'd probably enjoy it ten times more. True, you uh, didn't even know who he was. The thing is, he doesn't get anything added to yeah. him in that episode, but that's because, like, it is very important that he does not develop at all until Tuco dies. Like, that is... It is very yeah. important that there is no character development to this character until Breaking Man, Bad. If he throws Tuco's fucking grill in the water, oh it was my great. God, he has layers. He's like an onion. He's the top yeah. of the list right now for me. Yeah, same. <sighs> Can deal with that. Nacho. He's pretty cool. Nacho is the like out of all the characters in this show, he's the most blend of likable and competent. Like Nacho's yeah. effortlessly likable and charismatic, but he gets put into such a tough situation in those last two seasons. Like he, there's not a scene where he does not look stressed in the last two seasons of the Man, show. And the thing about Nacho is that like he realizes that he's been going down the bad, like Choice bad time to. Yeah, bad like times. bad choice road, and he tries to get out, but he keeps doing it by making bad choices. The thing like, is, like Nacho has pride in being a criminal; like he enjoys it. Yeah. However, he can't escape because he's already too deep. And when you think about it, Nacho and Saul had the same ending. I mean, mm-hmm. metaphorically speaking, one's actually dead. Uh, yeah. But uh, they both took themselves out of the game, took themselves out of the road, because it's the only way that they could do what mattered most, which was saving his father and absolving us all sins. Um, However, he's a very good fleshed out character, but he's not a character that develops a lot. He's just a character that goes through a lot of trials. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. So I could see him being top of A, too, but I just love him. So I don't know. I'd put him high up in A. I would too. Above Skyler. Yeah. Uh, he's better yeah. than Tuco. Maybe even Tuco, because you know yeah. what? He does get, like, he has a journey, you know? Tuco's there to. Nacho is also, yeah. like, the crazy breakout star of break, uh, Better Call Saul, I feel. like He's such a good actor. Think, like, he, he, had, yeah. he had to do a lot of subtle sh- I mean, they. I mean, actually, oh, yeah. Kim is probably the, the real breakout actress, but I think well, mm-hmm. like, Nacho's the second. Yeah. Um, and he was Vaz in Far Cry 3. That's crazy. Uh, mm-hmm. Speaking of uh, character similar, let's talk about oh, Lalo. My God, actual S tier, actual S tier. He yeah. is endlessly likable. Oh my God! Even from the first scene he was on the screen, yeah. every single scene he was in, I was just like, "Holy shit!" Could I love you it. imagine if Gus lost and Walter White had to go up against? <laughs> <Lalo>? <laughs> Oh no. my god. No, that doesn't happen, dude. <laughs> there is no Walter White. There, Saul can't yeah. save that situation. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my, that just cracked me up because I just, just the instant thought of Lalo talking to Walter, Walter shrieking into a, like a shriveled version of himself. Uh, <laughs> a very charismatic psychopath. He Lalo really would be is. like, whoa, hold on. <laughs> you want uh, now, he's also a character that doesn't develop, but he's just so, f- like, electrifying on screen. And I also love how he's not perfect. He fucks up with the Germans, he fucks up with <laughs> Fred Whalen, and ultimately, he fucks up with Gus the same way that Gus fucks up with Walt. 
by letting them get like by being too prideful and having to do it themselves um mm -hmm. and i like how like people are like i can't believe gus was able to outshoot lalo first of all gus got shot like four times it just happens to he was wearing a body armor so it is what it is uh and also mm -hmm. home field advantage and also, Gus was like a revolutionary in the past, which is something they very briefly bring up. So he shot a gun before. Mm hmm And he went in knowing a plan. Like, he had an idea of what he was going to do. He planned that gun there. A like, lot of people think his, uh, his death is underwhelming, but also, like, I think it had to happen that way. Right. And I think it, it's yeah. great for Gus's character. Mm hmm Also love the way it's shot. So, all right, we can throw him an S. Yeah. I think, uh, <sighs> it's, just, I think it's really important that they made him, like all but in unstoppable because like you said he makes mistakes sometimes but and you know what that they, they ended up being his undoing but whenever he's not making those mistakes he feels almost like a force of nature yeah. like lalo's coming i don't know what form he's gonna come in but he's gonna fuck us <laughs> up this is the scene where he calls the old folks home and he hears the click of the other line picking up and then, it's yeah, he, so he realizes it's like i just gave myself away i now need to call again and verify that the men are at the laundry like it's all show don't tell which you know like yeah. maybe that's a weakness with the finale it's maybe too show don't tell like say they explained uh saul's mindset a little bit more if you had a conversation with kim but they they keep it subtle so it's like oh people can't come to the conclusion that i came because it's too subtle mm -hmm. and like but that's fine i could see a lot of people not realizing like i read a lot of people didn't realize exactly <laughs> what lalo was doing in that scene <laughs> but that's par for the course Oh, it's we good. also like pause the scene. I think we talked for about five minutes. Like, what the fuck was he? What the fuck did he realize? And then we played it. Like, and we in four seconds later, we're like, oh, uh, okay. Yeah. That was fun to watch. Uh, yeah, we're getting down to the nitty gritty. If we're being honest, I think I think Howard or Chuck is next. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> boy, no. I so think Jesse or Mike, no, or Kim. Or Saul, I, or, I, or Gus. I think no, no one goes next. We're I, just going to leave it here. All right, it was good. We we we're, we need to wrap up in about fifteen to twenty anyway. So I think I think Willer, uh, open open up the new tier up at the very very top. You're you're <laughs> you're actually right. You're 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 actually right that this show deserves an S plus tier. Yeah. Okay, That's and the first you. character in it is Gus. God, he's such like. A contrast to the Tuco that came before him. He's so cold and calculating, but he's so much better at being an emperor for it. Yeah. It's like Gus is tough because he's very much set in his ways. He's a character that doesn't develop much, which makes like I could see people think that Gus's plotline is too long in Better Call Saul because at the end of the day, like it's like this is Gus before he was the god that we see in Breaking Bad when he had one last challenge to overcome. And that mm -hmm. is the story of Better Call Saul, how he overcame that challenge and got the confidence to move forward with his grand plan with the confidence that he had. Um, mm -hmm. But as a result, it's like, he doesn't have much room to grow, but I love the nuances that the like having Gus actually fear something and having Gus have a moment of reprise on his final scene adds a lot to the character, and I think it was worth it for that. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, but he's not one of like he doesn't have a grand development. He's just kind of like scary businessman who is super good at his job. So like maybe he doesn't have. I don't know if it's fair to say he doesn't have as much in many layers as the rest of these characters, but I don't know. What do y'all think? Uh, I mean, no, he definitely has layers, and I don't know, the, the tragicness to what happened to him in the past, to just, it legitimizes him a little bit more without excusing, like, slitting motherfuckers' throats with box cutters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't forget that time where he zip-tied a dude and let him suffocate in a plastic bag. <sighs> Jesus. That was, that was Jesse's homeboy, and that's when, uh, not Jesse, uh, that was, uh, fucking... Nacho's sort of homeboy, so that's when he realizes. You know, I wonder how much of that side of him was always in there, or how much of that only came out from so many years of working with these people. A little bit of A, a little bit of B. A little bit of yeah. A, a little bit of B. I think he's S plus. I think so too. I yeah, think, I think Gus is like, is is like just a great way to show like this is what Walter White is looking to become, right? Yeah. 
and, and like I think that's really important. And then, but instead of ego, he has revenge. Like that's what yeah. it's about. And then, like, what's interesting is like Gus gets his revenge and it very quickly loses everything. Yep, because he needed to rub it in uh, Uncle's face, Tio's face. Yeah, Hector. Y'all, I think it's gonna be a battle for next pick. I don't think we're. I don't think I'm gonna agree with y'all. I, I have a feeling. I, Mike, I just like okay. who the pick up next? I, I do okay. agree with Bradley. <laughs> Mike's the one. It, it is Mike. Mike is Man, great. Mike is. Mike's always been a fan favorite. Breaking Bad days. Walter. All he, the way back. He is so fucking memed. To, like <laughs> even in the original <laughs> episode, he appears in that he was intended to be a one-off in i was like this guy who came and gave jesse instructions i don't know what it is about him but like <laughs> man and the reason he had a one-off bradley is because bob odenkirk was on the how i met your mother set that day yeah so Bro. Put it in that, scene. <laughs> that is genuinely the story like are you fucking with me <laughs> like no. saul, saul was supposed to take care of that mike would not be a character if not for how i met your mother <laughs> that is fucking hilarious uh the thing with um, the thing with what's with Mike is that what well, Better Call Saul adds a bunch of layers to him that actually makes him like seeing him kill Werner and seeing him like talk to Papa Verga and Papa Verga's like, dude, you don't have honor. You're delusional for thinking that mm-hmm. you're operating outside of the bad choice road. You are a cog in the machine. That was such a great scene, but it makes you hate him a little more because like, fuck, he wasn't. He's very likable. But he's done a lot of bad things in his life, and you can't forget that, even though he's, like, a little bit better than the other criminals, he's still a super criminal. And, like, it's, like, I think also, like, with Mike is that he says it's for his daughter, but, like, I believe that just as much as Walt says that he's doing all the drug stuff for his family, like, Mm. just, I I don't know. Like, there's just a part of him that just cannot resist being doing this kind of stuff it's like he immediately goes to it in season one where it's like all right we're gonna go do the bodyguard thing we're gonna keep escalating because i need more money yeah it's like well you know what it is he's filling a void that cannot be filled which is the guilt of killing maddie accident like inadvertently Mm -hmm. and that like he's going to throw infinite money into that void to make himself feel better so i i don't like I don't know. I'd have to like maybe rewatch with that context, but I really do think he's trying to get money for Kaylee, but it's not necessarily like it is a hundred percent to appease his guilt, which is super interesting. Yeah. Now, yeah. a weakness to Walt to Mike is that there's only so much you can mine out of his relationship with Kaylee because it's like yeah, it's a granddaughter it, grandfather relationship. There's not much you can do there. <laughs> it gets very frustrating. I'm like, oh my god! But the scene of him in the uh, in the. Uh, uh, the 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 counseling scene or whatever with his daughter in law is great, and uh, I, I like I do like even though like we've gotten many of those scenes I do like the last scene we get with him and Kaylee which is like at this point of the show he can only look at Kaylee through a window because his life has gotten so complicated he doesn't even get to hang out with her anymore and that's like the last mm-hmm. scene they get together in Better Call Saul. Well, I don't know yes. who's next. I <sighs> guess it's Howard. Yeah. Yeah. God, think about this character's journey. He is the original antagonist of the show until they flipped the script and it was Chuck all along. And apparently, mm-hmm. they didn't even think that's the direction they were taking. I think they were writing Hamlin to be like a stuck up villain. And then they, like, a Patrick Fabian brought so much charisma and genuine emotion to the role, even though he, like, talks so robotic, there's still emotion there that they're like, oh, there is more to this guy. And they explored it for six seasons. Yeah, what a journey from, like, me i was just like fuck howard Yo, fuck this howard guy and i was like ah he's just i mean he's doing his job and then eventually it's like oh hey there's a boy howard and then howard. eventually became like leave howard alone <laughs> <laughs> you mean, see the fucking bowling balls over his fence to his car oh. christ dude fuck jimmy and it's like he represents the stuck-up lawyer the remnant of chuck but also like Howard actually addresses his problems by going mm-hmm. to fucking therapy and he becomes better. Yeah. And the subtext is Jimmy can't stand that. He has to unload yeah. some of his frustration that Howard gets to actually better himself. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think that's fantastic. Man, 
Well, How he's not allowed to get better over the guilt I've put onto him. Yeah, like, yeah, like, you killed my... That scene where he yells, where Jimmy yells at him in the courtroom, and, like, Howard's just walking away, is such... It's, like, an iconic scene in the franchise for me. Lightning fuck bolts. you, Jimmy. Fuck you, Jimmy. Uh, no, that's another... Fu- no, I think there's two fuck you Jimmys from Howard and one from Kim. Lots of fucking... Yeah. Chuck, Jesse, Kim... This is this is definitely my top five. Undeniably. Oh, yeah. but oh what 100%. Order. Mm-hmm. Uh, I ain't gonna do it. I, pick, I, picked, I picked Mike. Someone I picked else picked Chuck. <laughs> you picked Chuck? Alright. I picked Chuck. Dude. Man. Oh my god. <laughs> He, this character never stopped delivering. You want to know, like, what he did to amaze me in his most recent appearance in the final episode? Mm. The, the acting that he's able to do without saying words. Like, when Jimmy is like, you would do the same for me, right? Oh, my God. Like, that that's part of the skill of an actor. Just the look he had on his face for about half a second is all you need to see to realize, no, he wouldn't do the same. But he's not going to say that out loud. And he feels but, guilty about it internally. Yeah, and it's such a weird, complicated thing where it's like, in that last scene, you could rip, like... I, it, it's so complicated because of how we know on Chuck. Like, Chuck could have been genuinely trying to reach out to Jimmy and trying to help him there. But at the same time, he could have genuinely tried to, like, take more control of the lawyering situation. Exactly. And, the- and try to, like, get in, like, try to, like, buy, like osmosis or or by extension try to do lawyering through jimmy like it's so uh, such a hard read dude but you, the, you, know. you know what's truly brilliant is the dialogue the line yeah. is jimmy it's never too late to change your path which is very important to the finale of course but think about that line jimmy's complaining about his pro bono cases because that's where he or not pro bono but his public defense cases because that's where he starts the show off taking shitty cases for very little money and having to work very hard for it right that <laughs> line can be interpreted as like jimmy don't do public defense anymore maybe you should reconsider another field such as elder law or it could be considered jimmy don't be a lawyer i hate the fact you're a fucking lawyer it spits on everything yeah. that i love and you can't know which one he was saying in that moment because chuck is such a layered character you just don't know which one he actually meant it's up for the viewer a lot of people thought it was the more negative one i thought it was a more mm-hmm. positive one but i think both but are I, valid reads but i think also it's one of those things like we'll never know because yeah. jimmy never made the choice to sit around and talk to his brother God, that's like so that. good i'm floored i'm floored it's so good. Oh, like these are also the top five actors of the show. I would say these five people we yeah. have left because like yeah. they, they put on a tour de force. Um, the next choice is actually impossible. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> I mean, like my gut says Kim or Jesse. That that's the thing. We have the two main characters and the two. Do you call them sidekicks? That'd be. Fi- I feel like I'd be doing a dis- secondary, right. secondary main character. Secondary yeah. Main character. Yeah. Let's just end the podcast here. Like, no, we'll, let's, let's, we'll do Jesse, Kim, Walt, Saul. That sounds good. We can alternate shows. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know what? I agree. I actually agree. Jesse. We'll do the two secondaries and the two primaries. You don't. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you're actually right. Like, oh. and the the gap between the gap between Saul and Walt. And the gap between Jesse and um, Kim yeah. are both very narrow with each other. They're very close for me. But mm-hmm. um, Jesse's a tragic character, but he's also... Like, you can't deny the fact that he kind of got what he deserved. He got into this life. He was very manipulated. But there was there was jump-off points. Just like every other character in the show, there mm-hmm. were jump-off points that Jesse didn't take because Walt was feeding him a sense of purpose. And... God, that relationship between them is so good. It was the driving yeah. point of, of that's, Breaking Bad. That's a good point because one way I, one way I usually usually like to describe these characters is that, like Jesse is a very good man who is born into a bad situation in life, and Walt, you know, may have always had these monstrous capabilities in him, but just didn't have them come out of him until he was put into a bad situation yeah. but i think you're right that jesse fundamentally is a good person but he did have those jump off points mm-hmm. um and he didn't take them for whatever reasons whether he enjoyed what he was doing or like you were saying 
there is a relationship between Walt and Jesse, and both of them know it's there, but it's, I don't think oh either God. of them say, neither of them ever really say it out loud to each other. But no. it's like they both know that they see each other as a quasi father son. The mm-hmm. moment is in Felina, the final episode, where w- Walt frees Jesse and they just look at each other, and that is exactly that is a visual representation of exactly what Br- Br- Bradley just said. That unspeakable <sighs> bond that they somehow have. It is unlike any other bond on television, which is kind of related to Saul and Kim, which have the. Uh, Unlike any other romance on television. So it's like yeah. a father-son in a romance relationship that is just unmatched by anything mm-hmm. I've seen, at least. Ah, oh, it's so interesting. And he's so fucking funny. Uh, yo, bitch. Yo, bitch. Didn't say bitch once in the first episode. He said it twice. Man, he shares a cigarette with Kim, and thus indirectly kissing Saul in the mouth in the finale. Dude, it, <laughs> I, when I was watching that scene... Surreal. Scene, surreal. Oh my- it didn't feel real. But, you know, it, it was, like, fan service, but I also like what it added, where it's, like, it is both Kim's jump-off point where she's, like, I do not recognize this man anymore. He has created a persona and is not dealing with any of his emotions like I am. Meanwhile, it's, it's also, though. it's also like, is this guy any good? She says, when I knew him, which tells Jesse, it's, like, he is good, but you shouldn't be close to him because you won't, like, he's a, cur- a person you can't really trust as a human yeah. being. Here's why I like that scene and why it didn't, like, I, I obviously, like, it, it's fan service. Yeah, we get to see Jesse. But it didn't feel so fan service to me because I feel like even if Breaking Bad never existed, you could keep the dialogue in that scene exactly the same. Yeah. And it would still have an impact on Kim. Yeah. It really would because Jesse like Kim represented combo so this is like oh at the at like on a very base better call Saul standard like Kim helped Kim's outreach helped all these like connection of of people who aren't doing so good in life who are getting into trouble and like she's having an impact where Jesse recognizes her for her like full-hearted defense which is why we should talk about Kim Genuinely, one of the most complex characters I've seen in anything. This character is so hard to read, but that it's so fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I never expected her to grow on me as much as she did, and like when I was introduced to her in those first few episodes of uh, Better Call Saul, because you know that word I was trying to avoid earlier, sidekick. Like she really grew into being like the other main character. There, yes. there, there is totally an ending of Better Call Saul where Kim girl bosses Saul under the bus and gets away Yo. with it. And like, <laughs> I don't like that ending as much, but it still works. Uh, yeah. that, that's just like the kind of like, but like, man, she, Rhea Seahorn does so much subtle acting. So does Bob and, and Walt, which we'll talk about. But like, she, every time she like Jimmy does something and she tightens her jaw and she looks at him and she goes, okay. And you're just like, what is going on in your head, woman? We, what do you really like, we mean? Go, <laughs> we go on and on and on about how Better Call Saul is like the master of show, don't tell. And usually that's in regards to the directing. But all the actors and actresses do it, too, with yeah. their expression. I need to share a video I just watched about Bo- Bob Odenkirk's acting that blew, kind of blew my Hell mind. Yeah. Uh, the things that man does with his hands and eyebrows, <laughs> they, they go right over my head. But they're there. <laughs> Thank you. Oh man, Kim is great. Like, and I love how her flashback is mysterious. It's like, it seems like her love language is conning people, and it started with her mom. Her mom was also a no good person, and she gets like satisfaction, and um, she gets uh, what's the word? Her mom encourages her to kind of grift people. And it's something that she suppressed in herself. You can tell she's suppressed in herself for years and it's doing a good job like climbing up the ranks of HHM. But because her and Jimmy both have this love language of conning like people makes us feel good and makes us be more passionate with each other. We can be our worst versions with each other. There's something like twistedly romantic about that. And it just takes her down the bad choice road where it ends up at getting Howard killed. And that that journey is fascinating. It's but a good ass character. But what's crazy here is that she's the only character with a genuine conscience, and like, 
she can own up to it without having to be backed into a corner like like Jean and Saul can. And that is a like her being able to own up to it is is the last coming to Jesus moment that Saul had. Um, That's yeah. what's really cool because Jimmy is digging himself into this life and into this hole partially because he's deluding himself and avoiding guilt. But Kim, I would, she's in it's a way fun. she's in a way she's avoiding guilt, but it's also fun. But she's she seems to be much more aware of how morally That's terrible so the true. thing Saul does. You know, you know what's but oh she, my god! There's so many layers to this. She's aware of it, which is why she goes so hard on pro bono. She genuinely loves helping people, but there is one thousand percent an angle of she's doing it to make to feel better, to absolve her sins in real time. And at some point, she sees that like these things just don't mesh well together. She could have done so much good if she didn't turn the car around and finish that journey she was on with Cliff Maine. But instead, she did it because I was having fun. That is like a like an epic line from this show that's going to stick with me when she admits to that. She's someone who can admit it and admit that, that she's a bad person. That's one of the only quotes of the show that's never going to leave my brain. And then also the scene of her crying on the bus is like haunting. So Yeah. She, yeah. And then we get to the two big haunt shows. We've talked so much about these two <laughs> throughout the years. Um, it's such a tight race. Walt is so captivating. He's he's a he's a crashing blimp, and you can't take your eyes away from it. And Dude, you're kind of, but you're kind of cheering it on. You're like, yeah, Walt, get bad. It's like, whoa, whoa, not that bad. Fuck. I'm like, whoa, with whoa, Breaking Bad being one of the most beloved TV series of all time, I'm like, what do we say that hasn't been said about this guy? I mean, we've done talks about him. We don't have to go too much at death, but it's just like, I. I just love how that last ep- episode reinforced Walt's ego and his hidden guilt for Jesse slash his hidden relationship with Jesse when he glances at the watch, when he's asked the question. It's like, that's the watch Jesse gave him. And it's also like, I'm running out of time. I can't undo what I did. And like, if you want to talk about regrets, let's talk about regrets. Like, he slid back into his role so well. Brian Cranston's a god. And they, I feel like they had the core of Walt's character at the beginning of episode one. Yeah. Like, because, you know, by the end, he's like, you know, I did it. For me. What it, yeah, like, he did it because it was fun. He liked it. And, you know, a lot of people think maybe he slowly got there over time. Nah. But that's a feeling that was missing in his life that he needed from episode one when he shows up to his birthday party. And it's the most subtle things, like, you know... Hank making fun of him, like, ooh, ooh he, yeah. he's not a gun and guy. he, like, he softly chuckles to him. He's like, yeah. And then, like, being humiliated at the car wash, students stop paying attention. Like, this is a man who just feels emasculated by the world. And think of how powerful he felt with his drug empire. People, like, he was the chemist. He was the brilliant-minded chemist who was forgotten by the world because he never did anything with his gift. He starts making meth, and everybody in that underworld is celebrating him as the genius that he's always known that he is. And that's what's so cool about Walt to me is like the surface level is like, oh, it's, you know, it's a story about a guy getting money to pay for his cancer. But I'm like, no, it's not. Like this is a man who is desperately looking for I don't, validation in his as, life. As he got cancer and began dying is when he began to live. Like it's so twisted. Oh, man. I almost want to make an S++ tier for these two fuckers, because they're so good. <laughs> they're great. Uh, and let's talk about the man of the hour, our final discussion. I think this is one of the most complex and interesting characters that I've ever seen or read in anything. I can go back and watch episodes of even early Better Call Saul and look at small things, like very subtle things about Bob's acting that add so much nuance to this character. Um, and like uh, the thing is, he's more than one character too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Jimmy, Jimmy, and Saul and Gene all have these distinct personalities and represent, like, I was about to say different phases of unli- of his life, but not even necessarily. Sometimes he's all three at once. It, yeah, exactly. Like a lot of people will get mad when you talk about them, like they're split personalities or something. But it, it's it's a little more nuanced than it. it's like. 
yeah. masks that he wears at certain times to deal with trauma and stress. And it's just fascinating. Like, in the last episode, like, I think Joe mentioned, we got to see all three of them at different phases of the episode. It, it's just insane. And, it, like, I think the moment where I really fell in love with this character is, like I mentioned, in season four, Chuck dies. Jimmy's very quiet throughout the episode. Howard confesses to him. And Jimmy breaks my mind where he goes, well, Howard, that's your cross to bear. Then he walks over to his fish and just starts casually feeding it. And I was like, oh, your mind, you, Jimmy, you were a good person, but your mind is warped in ways I cannot comprehend. And it's, it, it's been a deep dive. And then when he is talking about Chuck at the bar hearing at the end of season four, and he, he has me hook, line, and sinker. He's talking about Chuck, Chuck's letter. He's going on and on about how he couldn't live up to Chuck's legacy, and then he spits it in my face. Like, there's times where you can... Jimmy is so obviously lying sometimes when he's, like, conning people, and you're like, I, if, if anyone had better sense, they could tell he's lying. But then when he pulls one over on the viewer, you really get to understand how much of a natural liar this character is. Never stop slipping, Jimmy. Yeah. No? I mean... Joe, what you got? What, what do you what you got about Jimmy? It's all gone, man. <laughs> I feel like uh, we you know he kind of got a lot of discussion in the episode portion of this podcast. Yeah, he did. We, we talked about it a lot. I mm. just he did. Yeah. What I, I think to go back to that, just my the draw for him as a character is this person who, like, isn't even avoiding the guilt on purpose like i don't even think he knows he's deluding himself and i'm like how do you begin to write how how do you begin to sit down and write that character it's yeah you you got you got to get him to the moment where he's about to kill the same kind of clientele that he honestly worked for in the past he's like what the fuck am i who am i (laughs) like if he killed marion his life would be better he'd be living somewhere else he would have got vacuumed like his life would be objectively better if he killed marion but he just there, all along, just like Walt had a little bit of humanity left, so did Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy was always more of a human. Um, yeah. You just keep begging for it to come out, and it doesn't. So it's all gone, man. Joe, you said it best. Y'all, y'all like this list? Because we, we'll wrap it up there. That's. I uh, I like this list a lot, actually. I, um, I would put Jesse above Kim, but that's just me. I would personally have Hank higher, like up in the S plus tier for me. But okay. Okay. I would Fuck drop it. I would drop Gus in place of Hank. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I would do Fuck that. It. Yeah. Well, yeah. how you feel about Jesse versus Kim? Actually, yeah. Let's let Joe be the uh, the side factor here. I I like Kim above Jesse for okay. sure. That, I, I, I wouldn't be mad either way. How about yeah. Walt? I think I think that <sighs> I think Walt is higher than Saul. I think Walt's a more interesting character study. Mm-hmm. But like, I enjoy Saul's. Stories so much more than Walt's. I think I, I, Saul, Saul's way more complex, and I think yeah. Saul's more fun to analyze. But when it comes to like enjoying the person on screen, I might enjoy Walt more on screen more. It's, yeah, I could I could see these takes. Like it's, like I said, it's it's narrow thin. I think because I've watched Better Call Saul like two or three times at this point. Yeah, I mm-hmm. just every time I rewatch it, I just get more fascinated by Jimmy. I mean, the same happens with Walt, but like uh, I just think they're both peak. We're talking about Dude, I mean, with, with the lens of the last episode and like what the show is ultimately working towards. I kind of can't wait to watch it again. Yeah, like I am keen for my Breaking Bad rewatch, which is just going to cycle into a Better Call Saul rewatch, which is just going to that's, that, that's so, just going to loop. That's going to that's going to loop for eighty seven years until I'm fucking dead. <laughs> uh, that's all, folks. Yep, I think we did it. Yeah.